there are four sections that we're going to be going over. Yeah. Uh, including, kind of to start, we're going to go over the fundamentals, uh, uh, just introduce digital logics and production rules, uh, the language that we're going to be working in. Uh, then we go into kind of the, the simplest self time circuit, and then we build from there. Uh, so we're going to be introducing kind of different pipeline structures, and then how to conditionally take inputs or produce outputs, how to uh, have some kind of internal memory, we're gonna work through all of these different things along with uh, all the fundamental concepts like uh, timing assumptions, uh, the different uh, timing frameworks involved um, and the general structure of self time circuits. Um, later in the course, we'll start getting into kind of formal synthesis. Uh, it's a way that we can uh, take a kind of control language, uh, control flow specification um, of a circuit and convert it step by step down into a uh, our production rules, our data flow uh, specification, um, and then we'll get into kind of some more advanced topics um, where we go over optimizations, uh, kind of more uh, challenging internal memory structures, uh, weird uh, channel structures, that kind of thing. Uh, so let's jump into uh, digital logic. So this class is designed to uh, be taken by people who have uh, kind of some CS background, and that's about it, uh, you know, programming. And so we're going to start with the very basics. Um, with digital logic, there are two basic devices, uh, and these are both three terminal devices. They're transistors, uh, the NMOS transistor and the PMOS transistor. And um, they are kind of uh, complements of each other. So uh, you see. Uh, you know, this makes CMOS logic a complementary metal oxide semiconductor. Um, so the three terminals, we have a gate, drain, and source, uh, and the voltage on the gate determines whether or not the drain and source are connected. Um, and so for the NMOS uh, transistor, the, when the uh, voltage on the gate is low, the uh, drain and source remain disconnected and current is not allowed to flow between them. Uh, when the voltage on the gate is high, then the drain and source are connected. Effectively, the switch is closed uh, and current is allowed to flow from one to the other. Uh, as we increase the voltage kind of continuously from low to high, at some point we cross the threshold voltage at which the channel between the drain and source uh, starts to become connected and starts to allow current to pass. Um, and then as we increase the voltage more, then you see kind of this exponential increase in current that's allowed to pass through the gate. Uh, and so it's not like a linear, um, it's definitely not a linear device, but uh, it can be modeled as a switch. Uh, and so, you know, we can connect this up to uh, some capacitor, some capacitive output. Uh, and assuming that the voltage on the capacitor uh, starts high, um, then at time T, the gate voltage uh, goes from zero to one then we will see the capacitor discharge over time kind of exponentially. Um, and so current will flow from uh, this capacitor through the, the transistor and down into ground. Um, does that make sense so far? Gotcha. And so kind of the, the summary behind the MOS transistor is when the uh, voltage differential between the gate and the source is low is at ground, then there's no current uh, flowing between the drain and the source. And when the voltage differential is high uh, at VDD, at the, at the source voltage, then uh, current's allowed to flow at the kind of saturation volt, at the saturation current of the transistor. And so we can model this um, at digitally uh, as basically if the gate is at zero, then the switch is open, current's not allowed to flow. And when the gate is at one, the switch is closed and current is allowed to flow. Um, and so that's the NMOS transistor. The PMOS transistor is kind of the complement. So when the gate is, when the gate voltage is low, uh, the source and drain are connected and current is allowed to flow. When the gate voltage is high, the source and drain are disconnected and current is prevented from uh, uh, tra traveling across the channel. 
And so as you increase the voltage from low to high, you'll run into this threshold voltage again, at which point the channel is totally disconnected. And so once again, if we attach this to a capacitor, this time the capacitor starts discharged. And then at time T, uh, the gate voltage transitions from high to low, turning on the transistor. Then uh, at that point, we'll start to charge the capacitor. Current will flow from the source uh, through the transistor uh, and into the capacitor, and we'll see uh, kind of this exponential approach to VDD. And so once again, if we look at kind of the, the simple behavior, uh, if the differential uh, voltage differential between the gate and the source is low, then current is allowed to flow at the saturation uh, current. And if it's high, then uh, current is not allowed to flow. Uh, and so when we look at our digital model, then if the gate is zero, the switch is closed, current's allowed to flow. When the gate is one, the switch is open, current is not allowed to flow. So this is the exact complement of the NMOS, right? Where NMOS had one zero rather than zero. All right, so now we can use these devices to start uh, creating digital logic. Uh, and the first gate that we wanna produce is the inverter. And so this takes an input, A, and if A is one, then we invert its value and produce that on the output. So if A is one, then B will be zero. If A is zero, then B will be one. Uh, and to do this, uh, we will start with an NMOS transistor. So this NMOS transistor, when A is one, the, uh, the switch here is closed and the channel is connected connecting B to ground. And so it pulled B uh, down to zero. And so we can represent this in code as if A, then B is pulled down. And that's a direct representation of this transistor. And this is the code that we'll be writing uh, once we boot up our tools. Um, and so when A is one, then B is pulled down. Uh, then we want to add a PMOS transistor to cover kind of the other side of that condition. So uh, when A is zero, uh, kind of indicated by this tilde in front of the A, uh, then B is pulled up. And so what happens is if A is low, uh, this channel is connected and current is allowed to flow from the source uh, into B, charging B. Uh, and at that point, so if A is low, this, is, this channel is connected and this is disconnected. If A is high, then this channel is connected and this is disconnected. Um, and so we have uh, a full specification of the inverter with these two production rules. Um, it's basically condition on the uh, current state of the circuit uh, implies some transition uh, on a signal in that circuit. And so we can uh, produce, uh, you know, this is the, the typical uh, symbol that you see for an inverter in uh, circuit specifications. We'll be getting away from this actually quite quickly and only operating on these production rules uh, because it'll be easier to think about the flow of events in these production rules rather than through these, um, through these symbols. But we can start to represent more complicated gates um, like the NAND gate. Uh, so if we have two transistors in series at the bottom here, which requires, which means that uh, both have to be high for both of these channels to be connected and for C to be connected to ground. And so this is represented by the production rule down at the bottom. If A is one and B is one, then C is pulled down. Up at the top here, we have two transistors connected in parallel, which means that only one has to be connected um, only one channel has to be connected for C to be uh, connected to that source. And so uh, we, re we represent this uh, with the production rules above. When A is zero or B is zero, then C is pulled up. Um, are there any questions so far? I think someone sent a question. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, okay, so 
the the context here is that the course uh, let me just pull it up the course is going to be uh, 24 sessions uh, we'll be going over um, four different uh, modules so the fundamentals we're going to get into template synthesis formal synthesis and then advanced topics so the fundamentals we're covering largely uh, the different timing assumptions, timing frameworks, the basic structure of self-time circuits, um, and then kind of representation of data, uh, kind of what a typical pipeline looks like, that kind of thing. For templated synthesis, we're going to be covering uh, kind of how to implement different kinds of logic in a pipeline stage. So having multiple requests, uh, dealing with uh, you know math or logic, having conditional input or conditional output. Uh, and then internal memory. Uh, in the third module, we will be covering kind of a formal method for taking a control flow language, uh, very much like C, um, and converting it step by step into um, a set of production rules. And then in the final uh, module, we'll be covering more advanced topics, uh, uh, more complicated internal memory structures, more uh, difficult optimization techniques, uh, kind of weird channel structures, that kind of thing. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to go back to. Uh, so we will be producing uh, circuit descriptions, which we can then simulate uh, and uh, we won't be doing layout, but you could do layout for these circuits and print them on a chip if you wanted to. Um, so these, this isn't like a software application, this is a hardware application. Um, I'm not sure that we're gonna be tying it to any specific, you know, solving any specific problem at the moment. Um, this is largely just like a techniques course. Okay, uh, so for our next uh, example, uh, we covered this. And so this is a typical symbol for a NAND gate uh, that you'll see in kind of a circuit diagram. Again, we'll be getting away from these uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and so kind of our next example is a NOR gate. Uh, and we have two transistors uh, connected in series up at the top. Uh, it's, it's kind of the inverse of the NAND. Uh, and so these two transistors uh, have to be both zero in order to connect the source to the output C. Um, and then we have two transistors in parallel at the bottom. And those two transistors, uh, only one has to be connected for uh, C to be connected to ground. And so the way we describe these production rules uh, is the same as we described um, in the NAND gate, which is if A is true and B, or sorry, if A is true or B is true, then C is pulled down. Uh, if A is false and B is false, then C is pulled up. Uh, and this is the usual symbol that you will see for a NOR gate in circuit specifications. Uh, so that covers everything for this lecture set, let's get into some examples. Okay. Um, so if people, I mean, likely people haven't gotten the chance to install the uh, development environment. Um, today we just added a uh, kind of walkthrough for in, uh, downloading and installing the development environment. Uh, if anyone is having trouble with that uh, at any time, let me know and I'll help, help you work through it. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let me open up lecture one. Um, Okay, 
So I've started up the tool set and um, we have two base problems, E1 and E2. Uh, and so E1, uh, this is kind of the what ACT, our development language looks like. Um, we have an import statement, much like you'd find in any other programming language. Uh, then we have uh, uh, kind of process definitions. And so process definitions are just a collection of circuitry that, uh, you know, like you would like you would implement a function in software. Um, it helps you uh, pick apart the circuitry a bit, helps you think about it, uh, and then black box it for later so that you don't have to think about it later uh, in depth. Uh, and so we're gonna look through, we're gonna be developing production rules to place into this PRS or production rule body. Uh, in this production rule body, we specify the source, uh, which is the uh, which is the, the top connected to the PMOS transistors. And then we specify the uh, ground, which is the bottom connected to the NMOS transistors. So we have three inputs. We have globals, G, and that has our power rails, the VDD and ground. Uh, and it often has our reset um, signals, which we will get into later. Then we have our, our input A and our output B, and we'll be creating an inverter much like uh, in the slide deck um, I showed. Uh, then down at the bottom here, we instantiate uh, the global signals and we instantiate our two uh, wires, A and B. Uh, the, the type for these wires is bool in the language. And then we're gonna be instantiating our inverter. Uh, it will be called dot, and we're gonna be connecting up the globals that we uh, created, and then our two, our wires, our input A and our output B. And so if our goal is to create an inverter, uh, then we're gonna be following the same production rules that we saw on the slides. So if A, then B is pulled down. If not A, then B is pulled up. Uh, and that's the sum total of the production rules that we need for an inverter. So with that written, I'll quit out of that. Uh, then we have a couple of other files. So we have um, our globals, and these define all of the signals that we see in our globals that we instantiated. You don't need to think too hard about this stuff. Um, we'll get in to depth into this in depth later. Uh, then we have our RC file, this. So the RC file uh, is used to interface with our simulator, give it commands, tell it kind of how to run the circuit and set it up. Um, because an inverter alone is not enough to uh, kind of produce inputs for the inverter and, and run it. Uh, then we have a make file here. Uh, and the make file, uh, I've kind of made it easier to work through uh, some of the op some of the commands that you need to run to compile and then run this uh, circuit in various contexts. And so E1 is our is our first example. We're going to be running that. So let's take a look at let's uh, go ahead and call make E1, uh, and that runs through uh, the different commands. We've got we now have E1.prs. So e1.prs is just a flattened version of the production rules that we wrote. So we have if A, then pull B down. If not A, then pull B up. And then we have all of these alias definitions for different signals. And most of these signals are our reset signals. And so we don't need to worry about them. Uh, then we also have this folder, E1, which was created. And that will be there for our analog simulation, and we'll show you that in a minute. So let's take a look at e1.rc. So these are all the commands that um, are placed into, kind of are run by our simulator. Uh, we initialize the simulator, set up random timing um, with a bound of between zero and 10 steps. Uh, then we set up our voltage rails and our reset signals. Was this generated whenever you ran make? This is included in uh, the Git repo. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, and so the Git repo is, if you look here, you'll find this in lectures and exercises. Um, and it goes to here. So you can go ahead and pull this and, and you'll have all of these things. Okay. Um, then we advance 40 steps, run through uh, a reset sequence, and then we can start driving our input. And so we set A low, we advance five, we set A high, we advance five, we set A low, advance, and so on. And so we're just toggling A to see B toggle. Um, now for our digital simulation, advancing five won't help much, um, but for our analog simulation, advancing five is fine. So let's replace this real quick with cycle. And that just uh, continuously cycles until um, until a transition has occurred. Because the timing is random, maybe the transition doesn't occur in exactly five cycles. Uh, and so let's actually just cycle and then come and doubt the rest of this and see what happens. So we say prsim e1.prs. We run that. The simulator starts. And then we say source e1.rc. Uh, I didn't, I forgot the comment, the way the comments work. But so we've got our circuit set up. Uh, and we have B is currently one. And so if we set A to one and then cycle, then A transitions to one and B transitions to zero. And then the simulator stops because no other transitions happen. This is an event-based simulator. And so we need to give it another event in order to uh, trigger the simulator once again. So we say set A to zero and we cycle once again. And at step eight, A is set to zero. And then it takes another eight steps for B to cycle back to one. So that's the digital simulation. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So I'm curious, uh, if you were to leave in the, those currently counted out mm -hmm. uh, and then just run, what would, what would look like just running the uh, file as given? Running the file as given will likely not produce transitions on B because it takes longer than five steps for B to transition. So I've reset the file. I'm going to source e1.rc, and it cycles, and there's an instability on B. We'll get to that later. Okay. Basically, B takes too long to transition. OK. So let's take a look at the analog simulation. What does this actually look like in continuous time and continuous voltage? Um, if we go into E1, the folder, uh, we have, we've generated a couple of files. So we have uh, our uh, prsim.rc that was copied over. prsim.rc. And we had, it's all the same, uh, except that we've added this, um, the netlist call, which pulls in the uh, analog netlist. So the, uh, in a, when, when running an analog simulation, rather than taking kind of the digital production rules, we pull those out and we, we compile it down into um, what's called an analog netlist. And the analog netlist has not only the transistors, but it has sizing um, and capacitance and resistance and inductance, all of the kind of more complicated analog effects that you get in a circuit. And so we're loading in that netlist with this command, netlist test.spy. And then we're connecting up that analog um, specification to our digital simulator through this digital to analog converter. And then the rest is largely the same. And so if we take a look at our uh, analog netlist, um, we have, we set up the power and ground rails um, and we drive them at a particular voltage, uh, 1.8 volts for, for power, 
for Skywater 130. We hook up our uh, process technology node. Uh, so the RC file is similar to a Verilog test bench. Uh, yes, it is. The RC file is definitely similar to a, a, a Verilog test bench. Uh, all right, so we plug in our uh, process technology node. This is, uh, for this class, we are using Skywater 130. Um, so far, it's uh, the easiest one to connect up to our analog circuit simulator. Uh, the circuit simulator that we're using um, for this is Zeiss. It is a uh, publicly available circuit simulator provided by Sandia National Labs. Um, there are other ways to plug in uh, either HSPICE, HSIM, uh, or other uh, circuit simulators into uh, ACT, but it, it takes a bit of doing. So then we include our uh, device under test specification, uh, and we'll get to that in a second. That has our inverter that we created. Uh, we give it the uh, digital to analog converter uh, and specify the model for those, for the digital to analog converter here. And then finally, we instantiate our device under test, our inverter. We give it power, ground, its input A, and its output B. All right, the rest just prints out the results that you want to see. It, it prints out the simulation. So we look at our device under test. Then we have uh, our subcircuit, the inverter. A uh, bunch of comments here, and then we have our two transistors. Our um, This is our uh, PMOS transistor, uh, and this is our NMOS transistor. And we can see width and length specifications here, along with a couple of other parameters. Okay. Uh, then we, so we've gone over Pearson VRC, we've gone over test.spy and dot.spy, then we have m.prs. And this just has all of the production rules necessary to run the digital side of the simulation. Uh, in this case, it's all just uh, kind of wire connections that aren't in the actual devices. All right, so once again, we fire up uh, PRSIM, so it's PRSIM, uh, and then we uh, give it env.prs. It boots up, we source PRSIM.rc to run the simulation, and off it goes. And so this um, is the uh, boot up sequence for Zeiss. You can see it loading in the, the, the netlist, and then uh, we get into the simulation, and we actually have um, noticed that A switches at time 85, and then again at time 90, that's our advanced five. Okay, so we can quit. Uh, and then we want to see the results of our simulation. So if we look back at the folder, we, have, we now have test.spy.prn. And if we look at that file, this is the result of our analog simulation. So it's just the uh, different timestamps along with um, uh, there we go along with the different voltage levels at those timestamps. And so we have uh, A, we have ground, we have B, and we have VDB. And we have the, the current of our power rails. Uh, and so we can look at this file by sending PR space View test.spy.prn. And that boots up, oh wow, that's really small. Um, that boots up a uh, waveform viewer that we've installed. Uh, and so if you want to look at the, at the two signals, then we have A and we have B. Um, and A is transitioning from zero to one. And similarly, we see B transition from one to zero following our inverter. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Okay. And then five steps later, we see uh, A transition from one to zero and B transition from zero to one. And notice the, the capacitive charge and discharge 
that we saw in the in the uh, lecture slides.